Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum and a good morning everyone. So uh, today I'll be cutting short this particular two hour lecture. Probably I'll just take an hour because I have another meeting at and uh, that means uh, I'll probably just have a one hour uh, of lecture today. Okay, so let me go immediately to the lecture itself. Uh, we have stopped at lecture 11 yesterday. Okay, uh, go down. So uh, yesterday, uh, we have come to the point of uh, looking at uh, some ideas about accelerated uh, motion. And uh, we have also discussed uh, something which is slightly out of the uh, topic of discourse, which is the, the, the effect of a uh, accelerated observer. And then uh, I think there would thing that we wanted to discuss uh, at the end of the lecture was essentially what happens to the case of uh, accelerated particles and particle uh, accelerators. So uh, we have seen yesterday, uh, so we had this uh, called relationship of energy with mass, okay, where gamma is your uh, relativistic factor. Uh, which is a one on square root, one minus v squared on c squared. So uh, one could uh, invert this particular uh, equation into uh, getting an expression for gamma, okay, which is now written as e over m c squared. So what we want to do in in this particular case is to see the effect of the mass uh, onto the relativistic factor. Okay, so. So what we're going to do is we have to fix the energy. So in other words, given a particular energy, for example, energy set by the particle accelerators. So uh, what will actually happen if you have um, a particle with bigger mass or a particle with lower mass? What will happen to the uh, gamma? Okay. So let me go to the whiteboard because I need to show you a different thing. So uh, essentially what we have, okay, so we have this uh, gamma equals to E, oops, what's happening? E over mc squared, okay, uh, so we fix E, right? And then we see the effect of, say, uh, making the mass bigger, for example, so that means you take m goes to uh, to increase, so you consider a heavier particle, for example. So, uh, in order uh, uh, to see the effect over here, your E is constant here, okay, because we fix the energy, see the uh, energy which is given by the accelerator, and then your C is just another constant. So, in other words, over here, you will find that. this problem okay gamma here is going to uh, essentially uh, decrease okay but what is gamma gamma is essentially given by one on say square root of one minus u squared on c squared where u is going to be the uh, velocity of the particle so so you can think of your particle uh, uh, sort of moving along in its proper frame, okay. So this will be the the relativistic factor uh, that is associated to the particle, okay. So in this particular case, you need, uh, as we seen just now, your gamma decrease when m increase. So that would simply say that your factor one minus u squared on c squared has to uh, increase okay, because this is on the denominator okay and uh, when this increase 
really what what it's saying remember that that this factor over here u squared on c squared is always less less than uh, one for ordinary particles okay so in other words uh, this has to increase uh, so you need your u to decrease okay so uh, what does that say so if you increase the, the the mass of the particle then essentially you'll find the difficulty of, of making your, your your particle to move faster okay so that's the essential idea so if you take a uh, so we will do a summary after this we, we decrease the mass then you need to increase your relativistic factor then uh, you will see that 1 minus u squared on c squared has to uh, decrease okay so in other words u in this particular case will increase okay so again over here what does it say you make the, the mass of the particle less then it's essentially gives you the uh, capability of um, making the particle move faster okay so now in other words uh, what we are uh, going to have so the implications here is that uh, uh, it's uh, let me write this uh, properly it's harder to accelerate uh, massive particles And it's easier to accelerate uh, what's called lighter particles. So essentially, this is a, a thing that we can actually uh, uh, observe from the point of view of this acceleration of particles in particle accelerators. So let me go back to the notes. okay so uh, so for instance uh, uh, one of the early experiments that people do is essentially uh, to accelerate electrons okay in the early days and then electrons and uh, and then you have the anti particle of the electrons positrons so when they collide they produce uh, massive energy which uh, in in turn uh, give you uh, lots of different no, exotic particles okay so that was the early days but then uh, today we have the, the, what we call the LHC uh, I'm not sure how how uh, familiar uh, everyone is uh, to this idea of this is what large hadron collider so this is more difficult to do your hadron is actually a more massive particle okay so and and when they collide these two hadrons together they produce uh, a lot more energy and essentially you produce more uh, exotic particles okay so that is what they do in particle accelerators okay but as as as, as we said earlier in this particular case the technology has to come later because it's it's more difficult to accelerate hadrons compared to uh, accelerating electrons in the earlier days okay so the other thing that one can actually do with respect to this is to invert uh, this gamma factor okay this gamma factor to get uh, uh, an expression for velocity and then gamma itself is now given in terms of that so one can essentially write this as a, as an expression your velocity as, as an expression in terms of the energy and the mass okay and uh, one can actually calculate uh, uh, for a particular given energy uh, and suppose you assume the, 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 the particle that you want to observe is essentially the electron so you know the electron mass okay so one can substitute inside this and then calculate what the electron speed 
in this particular uh, what you call accelerator for example okay so for example if you supply an energy of one mega electron volt okay then uh, one can actually see uh, the electrons being uh, speed up to uh, quite close to the the speed of light which is just uh, 86 percent of the your the speed of light okay and then if one increase the energy of the uh, uh, energy supply in the particle accelerator to say uh, tenfold so this is ten times okay then you'll find that uh, the the particle speed or the electron speed here increased to uh, almost speed of light but not close enough okay so it's still less than speed of light and the percentage increase here in terms of speed is about let me just check with my calculation here it's a 16 percent increase and you probably have heard when you you you, you know increase the velocity then you you find that your your the initial mass becomes bigger and you can see that's happening over here so suppose I increase your uh, the, the accelerator uh, supply entity to 1 GeV 1 giga electron volt this is uh, around 100 times okay so and the speed that you get is only uh, increased by 0.13%. Okay, so in other words, uh, as you go higher in speed, it gets uh, di more difficult to accelerate the particle. Okay, so okay, so that's a little bit of particle physics to you. Uh, okay, here is a few other things that we of no would be nice to know it's not quite relativity in a way but uh, let me check okay, everyone's in okay. uh, but it's useful uh, to know some of the which actually can be uh, implied from uh, uh, relativity itself okay the first thing that we have seen uh, uh, is the idea of our relativistic units okay so what happens in a relativistic unit is essentially you set c equals to 1 okay so c becomes a pure number in this particular case it's dimensionless so uh, if you uh, think of what c is supposed to be c is supposed to be a speed which is uh, uh, the dimension length times dimension of time inverse okay so and this becomes dimensionless then you essentially get this uh, equivalence of dimension between space and time so this is essentially from your test one you still remember one of the question in section a okay uh, but we can go further uh, you still use this idea of relativistic units and then uh, one of the things that we have seen uh, is the idea of your energy being given by the relativistic mass times c squared so you allow your c to be equals to one then your dimension of e will be equals to the dimension of m so in other words your mass has an equivalent dimension with the dimension of energy okay so uh, that's why uh, in particle physics you will see that uh, uh, what you call you'll see that uh, your the masses of the particles are always given in terms of electron volt and what's what's electron volt uh, volt is the units of uh, volt, voltage units is actually joule per coulomb okay so when you multiply e which is the charge which is measured in terms of coulomb then uh, essentially what you get is the uh, units of okay so in other words, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, one of us do in particle physics is to measure the mass in terms of energy. Okay. Uh, do I want 
to do anything else oh yes okay maybe i should go to this just to show you uh, this web page so you can actually see over here for example uh, your electron is uh, given in terms of this is essentially the rest mass okay it's given in terms of uh, uh, in terms of mega electron volt okay mega electron volt which is uh, in this case has the value of 0 0.511 okay and then you know that uh, electrons uh, there are heavier version of these electrons called muons so this is about 105 mega electron volts okay and then the another heavier partner which is uh, again uh, this is what we call the third generation okay uh, this is uh, what is this uh, it's 1776 mega electron volt okay and then your uh, you have your neutrinos for example uh, initially when uh, the uh, in the early say 80s uh, no, before they uh, they found neutrino oscillation they were thinking of the neutrinos to be massless but they, they still can find the limit of this mass so it's written in terms of uh, inequality okay so here is uh, what 10 1 2 3 4 5 6 10 minus 6 mega electron volts okay so that's the sort of bound so it could be less than that okay so the same thing for the the muon neutrino and also the tau neutrino it's only given in terms of a bound okay you could not measure this uh, directly because neutrinos are much more elusive uh, compared to the other particles what about say uh the other particles that that you should know about is quarks so uh remember i mentioned about hadrons so the hadrons are actually make up, made up of quarks so and and you won't be able to see quarks uh, freely so they are always bound inside hadrons and that makes uh, calculation of their mass to be a bit more difficult okay so so for example uh, uh, you have the up down and up and down quarks usually in 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 uh, ordinary particles for example proton is if i'm not mistaken up up down okay combination and then neutron is up down down okay so you can see that okay uh, the 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 mass is given here in terms of mega electron volt and then you have heavier uh, quarks charm and strange and then finally top and bottom the last quark that they have seen is essentially the top quark okay, which is i think around 90s or late 80s they found that okay right so let me get back to the notes the other thing uh, one can always do this dimensional analysis to help you uh, understand what's been done in in particle physics is to see uh, uh, another set of units uh, called the natural units so what is done in the natural units uh, you you have taken c equals to one that gives you the relativistic units but on top of that you also take h equals to one h is a Planck constant okay and you know that uh, uh, for for particles of light, for example, they obey this uh, uh, Planck relation E equals to H nu. So if you take H equals to one, what will that say? Then your dimension of your energy is given by the dimension of your frequency. But what is dimension of frequency? Dimension of frequency is just the inverse of time. And remember, we have also have c equals to 1. So in other words, the dimension of time is equal to the dimension of length. Or in this particular case, the dimension of energy is now given in terms of inverse length. 
And uh, what would that implies is that if you, if you want to investigate uh, smaller distances, okay, so that means you want to have, okay, L goes down, so that means L inverse has to go up, and if L inverse goes up, then your E goes up. Okay, I'm, bit, uh, I'm using a bit of abuse of notation. These are just dimensions, but you can think of this uh, a quantity which which has dimension line. Okay, so so in other words, to probe this smaller distance, you need higher energies uh, to be involved. So that's why uh, you have to use accelerators to to actually probe. Uh, the nucleon structure, for example, and, and what happens inside protons and neutrons. Okay. So that is perhaps the only interesting thing I wanted to say. There are the things over here which talks about electromagnetic waves. Okay, this is again a, a problems of units. So uh, let me just say that uh, in terms of electromagnetism, there are uh, uh, confusion of units. Uh, what happens is, uh, for example, in this particular case, you have your Coulomb's law given by uh, this kind of equation. Okay, your K is essentially like a coupling constant that couples the charges together. Okay, and this K depends on the units. Adopted. Okay, so in CGS, uh, which is actually an SI unit, okay, which is a centimeter, gram, and second, okay, your K is given by, uh, is, is set to be equal to one. While in the S, the normal SI units, the MKS, which is meter, kilogram, and second, your K is set as this quantity. So there is a, a it causes a lot of confusion in terms of the, the, the kind of uh, uh, units that you, people use inside electromagnetic, electromagnetism. Okay. So these are things probably you, you know, you, you can you know, be aware of in terms of this dimensional analysis. The other thing is what else over here is Okay, here is the idea of relating it to a fine structure constant. Again, this is something that is defined in particle physics. So essentially what is done over here, uh, remember your epsilon naught and mu naught is related to the, the inverse of your uh, speed of light in this equation, for example. So what people do here, essentially, they only uh, determine one of them experimentally because you have this particular relationship uh, through the fine structure constant. Okay? So in this case, uh, today, the one that's been experimentally measured is essentially your uh, the, this magnetic constant, which we call the permeable permeability so right I think that's about it okay so let me go to this uh, section as the last part of this uh, lecture 11 so one of the things that we have so far described uh, how to define a uh, four momenta how to define uh, four velocity uh, four force the, the four vector of force and four vector of momentum and four vector of velocity. Uh, but uh, in Newtonian mechanics, we also are aware of that you can actually define angular momentum. So how can you define angular momentum in the case of uh, uh, special relativity? So uh, let's recall a little bit, uh, for example, uh, Angular momentum is given by R cross P in terms of vectors over here. So, uh, example is L1 is essentially a cross product here between X2 P1 
P3 minus X3 P2. Okay. So this suggests this form of this difference uh, of these two quantities, but the index being swapped, suggests that we should define your angular momentum special relativity given by uh, a similar kind of uh, uh, difference uh, between the two quantities. So you define L mu nu uh, equals to X mu P nu, okay, and then uh, take the difference with uh, X nu P mu. Okay, so in other words, this is an anti symmetrized version, so I can write in terms of the square bracket. Uh, this is just another notation if you know, uh, to show that this is equivalent to that. And this L mu nu is essentially a pseudo tensor. So in this particular case, is the uh, a contravariant pseudo tensor. And one can also write down the, the covariant thing. So this is the covariant case. Uh, why I want to do this? Uh, essentially because I'm defining in terms of, uh, remember your determinant can be given in terms of uh, uh, this alternating tensor. So our cross product is actually related to determinant. So here I can rewrite your L mu nu, but in this case the covariant version, in terms of epsilon mu nu rho sigma, and then this product between the four vector of position and four vector of uh, sigma. Okay. So this, uh, why is this been done? rather than uh, defining from, from this contravariant case because here I'm defining your contravariant uh, four vector, four position vector, and then the contravariant of uh, four momentum vector, okay? And then the one that we define, if I'm not mistaken, I have to check this. Uh, we have defined epsilon mu nu rho sigma equals to plus one if this is an even permutation and minus one if odd and zero else, okay? But if you do this, you can uh, define this contravariant case using a, a, a different version of the epsilon, which is the epsilon u nu rho sigma. And remember that we have defined this. This has a, an opposite sign. So that's another reason why um, using this to define it in terms of epsilon, okay? So, okay, this epsilon also tells us, okay, if you uh, exchange mu and nu, then it will actually give you uh, the, the anti-symmetric properties because epsilon mu nu rho sigma is a totally anti-symmetric pseudo tensor. So the pseudo part is coming from this epsilon thing, okay? So similarly, uh, one can do this for the, 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 the contravariant case as well and then show that it's anti-symmetry, which you no know, is reflected from the, the ordinary uh, relationship for your Newtonian angular moment, okay? And here one can start uh, enumerate, enumerate the components, for example, L12 will correspond to LZ, L31 correspond to LY, okay, and then L23 correspond to LX. Uh, so in other words, we replace uh, your, your mu and nu uh, in terms of your spatial indices, I equals to 1, 2, 3, okay, then you get back your ordinary angular momentum uh, components. The question is now, what about the fourth component? Okay. Uh, the fourth component involves uh, one of the index being uh, a four. So in this particular case, we just simply uh, plug in into this, this particular formula. For example, then you have 
x4 pk minus xk before what is x4 x4 essentially is, is equals to cd what is pk this is just your relative state momenta for momenta so it's given by gamma mvk okay. and then uh, this uh, will be subtracted with uh, xk p4 so you have xk and p4 is actually gamma mc okay so if i bring the factor of gamma mc out actually uh, this one is a, a mistake here i'm taking out your t as well um, that there's a t so i'm taking out the t as well here gamma mct so uh so this mct is going up okay and that leaves your vk over here and then uh over here there's no t so that means i have to take away uh to divide by t okay so that is the component the component of your the fourth component of your angular momentum in relativity now, how can we understand this fourth component? So, physical idea. Well, one of the things that we can observe is that if you allow, a, a, instead of a rotational motion, you just talk about a linear motion. Okay? And in linear motion, is uh, your xk, your, your k position, uh, sorry, your cave component uh, of position okay, is given by the, the velocity, okay, the cave component times t. Okay? It's a linear motion. Okay? So if that is the case, then we'll find that uh, here will become vk uh, times t divided by t. So that gives you a vk okay, for this term. So we get vk minus vk, then this thing equals to zero. Okay. So if the motion is linear, then this fourth component is going to be zero. So in other words, uh, what we have over here, your L4k is considered as a measure of duration from the linear motion. Okay. Right. The other thing that uh, it's good to, to, to calculate is to consider the magnitude of angular momentum. So um, uh, a magnitude of angular momentum uh, in this case usually are considered as a scalar. So how do you form scalars in, in the case of special relativity? You just simply make sure that there's no free index uh, form from combining the two quantities. So, so over here I'm contracting the mu here with this mu and this new here with this new so essentially this gives you a scalar so what is this scalar supposed to be well we plug in uh, your uh, definition of l mu nu and then also the definition of l mu nu at the bottom the covariant case and then you just multiply up every case and then uh, you will have to use this particular fact x mu x mu is just the same as x nu x nu or x mu p mu is the same as x nu p nu okay so if you use this fact then you get essentially a factor of 2 out okay so you get uh, 2 times this quantity which is x mu x mu p mu p nu p nu and then here is sort of the cross term x nu p mu x nu p nu okay so uh, in, sh in short I can write this as an x squared here this is an x squared and then this is a p squared and then this one is considered as an x dot p squared okay uh, so well, one can actually calculate what this is, but but uh, no. For example, p squared, if you remember, is going to be equals to minus m not c squared. 
your x squared will be the uh, essentially uh, the x mu x mu is like your uh, the four dimensional interval. Okay, so uh, but uh, probably this is not so uh, enlightening. But what is the more important thing is if you consider your l mu nu l mu nu directly. Okay, what? Uh, how this contract this uh, will give you this quantity okay so this is from the spatial part spatial uh, contraction and then this is coming from the uh, the, uh, the fourth component contraction And that has to be equal to that. So somehow, no. Uh, this is this two quantity is going to be related to these two quantity. Okay. So that's probably the best. Uh, it's not uh, not so much a in, uh, physical intuition over here. It's just the quantities are just uh, a little bit messy than uh, wants people. Uh, okay, the other thing that we want to see is uh, the idea of conservation of angular momenta. So in Newtonian mechanics, uh, one uh, have the idea of torque, which is R cross F. So if you have your force to be equal to zero, then your tau to be equal to zero. So it's a similar thing over here. If you have your, if there is uh, your four-dimensional force, the four force equals zero, then essentially uh, that will lead to this idea of your angular momenta, the relativistic version of it will be also conserved. Okay, but why is this really? So I can simply uh, express this thing uh, out. Okay, uh, take the differential. Uh, of this angular momenta uh, tensor here and then uh, substitute the definition of it okay uh, and the other thing that one has to remember when you do the, the so-called time derivative you use the, the tau because tau is a, a proper scalar proper time so this is a scalar if you use the, the time coordinate, then you know it depends on the frame. So this is the more appropriate uh, quantity to, to have. So you have this now, because you have the two uh, x rho and p sigma, for example. So you have one uh, derivative over here, another derivative coming here. And then what is this derivative? This derivative is just simply uh, your four velocity. And then what is uh, this derivative here? That's your four force. So your your four velocity here is combined with this four momenta, but you know that that four momenta is defined by uh, p sigma here is given by m v sigma. Okay. So in other words, these are essentially. Uh, uh, proportional in some sense okay and when you look at this this is actually uh, if you interchange rho and sigma here is a symmetric case because you can swap them it's two independent spread uh, what you call factors here but here if you swap between rho and sigma over here is anti-symmetric so when you combine an anti-symmetric part with a symmetric part that gives you uh, essentially gives you a zero okay. uh, i believe we have done this in some exercise okay when you you make a contraction uh, between a symmetric uh, quantity with a anti-symmetric quantity you can actually prove it to be equal to zero okay so this term is gone so what's left is essentially this and this has the the right what you call uh, form 
for the the analog of this uh, idea of a talk. Okay, so that is essentially uh, the one being defined over here. The talk in uh, special relativity is given by your epsilon mu nu rho sigma times x rho f sigma. Uh, the one below is nothing, uh, nothing much here. It just says that okay, if you have your your covariant uh, version of your angular momentum, if it's conserved, then also uh, that would tell us the con contravariant version is also conserved. Okay. So that is, uh, I think that would be the end of this lecture eleven. So maybe I should pause at this stage uh, to see if there are any questions from anyone. Are you still there? Okay. Okay. So I'm not talking to uh, pictures. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, let me move on because I want to finish earlier. So let me just get into lecture 12 now. Okay. So since we have defined most of the things that we want, we have defined the four velocities, four momenta, the energy, relativistic energy, and also your four force, your torque, your angular momenta. So one can actually do uh, some problem solving. So uh, one of the things that we are interested in is to look at particles in collisions. So, so that is essentially this particular lecture to see what are the related concepts uh, involved when you have all these relativistic quantities uh, and then what does it imply to uh, collisions of particles. Okay. So one of the things that we have learned is essentially the conservation of four momenta. Okay, so that involves conservation of the three momenta as well as the fourth component. And the fourth component is essentially your energy. So it's given by E equals to gamma mc squared. Okay, and also from this E equals to gamma mc squared, okay, we also have the idea of the equivalence of mass and energy. So when you say they are equivalent, and one of the implications that one is saying is that one can actually convert from one quantity to the other quantity. So one can uh, convert from mass to energy or from energy to mass. So we're going to see how this can actually happen. And uh, because of that as well, uh, one doesn't talk about conservation of mass separately from conservation of energy inside special relativity. But rather one talks about conservation of mass and energy. Okay? So if you have conservation of mass and energy, that means the total mass and uh, the total mass energy of a system of particles is going to be conserved. Okay? So this is the right uh, or, uh, way to do in uh, inside special relativity. So let's consider some, some uh, hypothetical. So consider an isolated system of particles. And this isolated system of particles are going to be interacting with each other. Okay? And each of these particles will have some mass. So in this case, uh, you can have uh, the I particle here with the uh, rest mass Mi and then it's moving with velocity vi giving you the relativistic energy ei okay and and your i can go from say uh, from one to n on the number of particles in that isolated system okay so if the the total mass energy is actually constant then you can actually see that this is uh, implying that your mass energy uh, of the individual particles added up together must be equal to that. 
Okay. So let's look at uh, some uh, more specific uh, example of this. Let's consider two particles equal mass. That means m1, uh, m2 as mass m. And then we consider that they are moving towards each other with opposite velocities. So u1 has velocity u and u2 has velocity minus u. So when they um, bump into each other, they coalesce, that means they are joined up uh, together to form one single particle, say, uh, with a different mass now, given mass, mass capital M. So what does the conservation of mass energy say? Okay, then uh, essentially you have the individual uh, what you call relativistic energy here, added up together. Oh, uh, the other thing that I forgot to say, that this single mass energy uh, will be at rest. I don't know where this, let's see here. Okay, now uh, here we are considering this uh, single particle mass m will be at rest. Okay, so here, uh, so your individual particles here, they have uh, the same magnitude. Okay, you put a minus uh, inside here, basically uh, over here is minus uh, minus u squared. Okay, so that is just simply u squared. So this these two quantities are just the same. Okay, so when you add this up, you get this uh, quantity 2m here, and that must be equals to the mc squared. Okay. Uh, remove your c squared from each of the terms, so you get this capital M equals to 2m over square root 1 minus u squared on c squared. And you know that, okay, this term is going to be uh, less than 1. Okay. So, and it's at the denominator. Okay. So, if, if this is less than 1 at the denominator, so that must be greater than greater than two uh, m. Okay, this quantity must be greater than two m. So what does that say then? That this mass uh, that comes from the collision of two particles is actually uh, bigger than the the individual masses that that existed before. Okay, and the difference between the, these two is called uh, the mass defect, okay, delta M here. And this delta M is essentially, uh, you can rewrite this as in terms of the en energies of the individual particles, okay. Uh, okay, so let's see how this actually works. Okay. Uh, so let's just uh, uh, rewrite this equation. Oh no, sorry, this equation, sorry. This equation, uh, so this is delta M uh, equals M minus 2M. So uh, if I just rearrange it, I will have M equals to 2M plus delta M or delta M. Well, okay. uh, that is just saying that this is greater than 2M. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's use this equation, okay? Let's use this equation, just that part. That part uh, will actually give you this expression over here. Your capital M here is given by that. So this is capital M. Then minus 2M is just minus 2M. And then you can uh, uh, bring out uh, the common factor here, 2M, uh, and then multiply by this quantity of uh, the relativistic factor, minus 1. But this is the same thing that you had before. If you remember, uh, how do we define the relativistic kinetic energy? It's just gamma minus 1 mc squared. Right? So now I have this individual case. This will be t1 or t2. Okay. 
Okay? But they are equivalent actually. So that gives you the same quantity as uh, as the one above. Okay, from the mass defect. Okay, sorry, mass defect. So in other words, uh, this is the the this one is actually that, and this one is actually, that, and they are equal. But what does that say? What does that say? That says that okay, uh, what happens in this particular case? Initially, you have this kinetic energy involved uh, with the two individual particles. They get somehow converted into mass. Okay, and that gives you the the reason why the the new particle, which comes from the uh, collision of the two particles, the mass is actually bigger than the the two individual particles at the beginning. Because your kinetic energy from the beginning uh, collision uh, becomes uh, no, being converted into mass. Okay. Uh, right. What do we have down here? So uh, this uh, idea can be also uh, related to the idea of binding energy. Okay. So in this particular case, for example, uh, the bound particle that you get from making the, the collision of two particles okay, has a binding energy, which is greater than zero here. Okay. And uh, Uh, I should be saying the, the one below. Uh, okay, uh, the idea is that okay, the bound system has included this idea of binding energy, okay, and this I begin on the wrong uh, uh, perspective here. Okay, uh, let me go down here. Okay, perhaps this is much better. Uh, so you have this bound system, okay. Your binding energy uh, goes into the other side, okay, and becomes a negative quantity, okay, and this negative quantity uh, sort of offset the thing in such a way that this becomes uh, something which is. Uh, uh, I should say this. Mm. Okay, let, let me begin again from here. Okay, so consider now instead of the because I'm take confusing two different situations. So the earlier case is essentially I have a two particles here, uh, sort of moving towards each other, and then they coalesce into a bigger particle. Okay, so that was the first situation. So uh, what actually happens in this particular case when I talk about binding energy is essentially the reverse. I have a bound state here, and then it decays into two particles. Okay. So the bound state here is actually involving what we call the binding energy. Okay. So in other words, if I think in terms of uh, the conservation of, of, of mass energy, I will have to consider this binding energy. Okay. So the, the bound state, in order for it to decay, to, to the two particles must consider this idea of binding energy which is uh, considered in this particular case to be greater than zero okay and that will be equivalent to the mass energy of the the final state so the final state is now the individual particles so it's it's a different situation from the one considered above okay and if you take this equation rearrange it in this way okay so in other words you have your mc squared alone on this side of the equation and i have this binding energy uh, written in terms of a negative quantity here okay so what do we have in this particular case is that this binding energy is considered being negative okay 
is considered as a potential energy of the interaction uh, between the two particles or uh, between the n particles in this particular case okay so uh sorry about the confusion guess because we have two different situations okay. all right should i go into this it's already at 10 o'clock so probably this is a good place to stop at this stage as i mentioned i have another meeting going on at 10 so probably i will have to stop now so let me take uh, the attendance here Okay, uh, I think that's it for today. So, sorry about the early uh, ending of this lecture. Okay, thank you everyone. Oh, by the way, uh, you can now uh, spend your extra hour looking at this uh, set of papers that I've given you. So, uh, each group, the maximum number of members would be three. Okay, and then uh, each group will have to be doing a different paper to review a different paper. Okay, so please uh, select this and then uh, uh, write it into your WhatsApp to see who's taking which paper. Okay, so I think that's it. So uh, thank you everyone. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah.